Uh, good evening and welcome to the Inner City Commission meeting of Tuesday, February the 7th. Um, I, we recessed out of executive session and I'm going to reconvene us into regular session. Um, Can we get the slides up? There you go. All right, so Ms. Wade, if you could please call roll. Present. Here. Here. Mr. Jones. Here. Mr. Jones. Here. Mr. Baker. Present. Mr. Watson. Here. Mr. Hanza. Here. <laughs> That's Shirley over there. All right. Um, if we could stand now for the invocation and um, Kristen, would you like to lead us in an invocation? Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you um, for the opportunity to gather in this place. I thank you for each one here this evening and their heart for our community and ask that you would guide and direct these leaders as they make decisions for our city. Lord, I ask that you would give us the eyes and heart of Jesus as we're out in the community. And we just especially want to thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins. We thank you for that love. We thank you for forgiveness. And we thank you for grace. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Now we will open up with presentations by our city manager. Thank you, Mayor Juneman. Our first presentation is a, a shout out to um, Quality Inn. And Kristen, are you going to come forward and give them some recognition for um, their support during the recent um, bad weather? Yes, yes. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so we just wanted this evening to recognize the Ozimi family and their business, the Quality Inn of Ennis. The Ozimis have a heart for our community and treat all who enter their hotel in a kind and respectful manner. They are always willing to work with the city when we are seeking overnight accommodations for our neighbors without shelter or heat. Most recently, they partnered with us over Christmas weekend and again this past week during the freezing temperatures. Those Emmys are a true picture of the Blue Bonnet spirit and being Christ's hands and feet in our community. Please join me in a, giving the Ozimi and Quality and Family a big Ennis. Thank y'all for all you do. Thank y'all. Thank you. So they couldn't, they couldn't be here this evening, unfortunately, but they wanted me to pass along a big thank you to each of you for the recognition. They said it was a true honor. So thank y'all so much. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Kristen. We do have a couple of new employees um, this evening. Jason Amison is joining the wastewater plant as a, an operator. Joshua worked at Penco Inc. Ennis for eight years as a maintenance supervisor prior to joining the city. He holds a universal EPA and hazmat ground shipper certifications. Joshua, his wife, and two sons, age six and eight, live in Ennis. They're very active in attending the boys' football and soccer events. Joshua looks forward to growing up in his new career and the many opportunities the city has to offer. His hobbies are watching his boys play sports, hunting, fishing, and working out. So welcome to the city of Ennis, Joshua. And Ray Martinez is joining the sanitation department as a sanitation loader. Ray previously worked as a packer at Columbia Meat and a temporary sanitation loader through Top Notch Personnel Agency. He lives in Ennis with his parents. He feels working for the city of Ennis will be helping out his community. His hobbies are playing soccer, working out, repairing cars, and spending time with family and friends. Welcome Ray Martinez to the team. Now we have a citizen's public comment period. The city commission invites citizens to address the commission on any topic not already scheduled for a public hearing. Citizens wishing to speak should complete a citizen comment period form and present it to the city secretary prior to the meeting. Speakers are limited to three minutes. In accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, the city commission cannot take action on items not listed on the agenda. However, your concerns may be addressed by city staff, placed on a future agenda, or responded to by some other course. At this time, I will open the citizens' public comment period.
no one wishing to speak, I will close the citizens' uh, public comment period and move to commissioner updates. Do any of the commissioners have anything that they'd like to, to speak about? Yes, I'd like to just recognize and thank the police department and the fire department for everything they, they did during the bad weather that we had. I know that we had a, a number of car accidents um, and, and issues across the city. And uh, just as usual, um, thank you to the police department and fire department for always being there for uh, for the citizens. And uh, just one other quick recognition, wanted to recognize our city secretary. She has, uh, as of this week, has now been with the city of Ennis for seven years now. So I uh, just wanted to, to recognize her for that. Thank you. We appreciate everything you do. Anyone else? If not, then we will move to consent items. And I'm actually going to pull item F1. <coughs> Mayor? So, yes. We need to announce um, the action resulting from executive session. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, which is, there's no action. There's no, yeah, I was going to say. Okay, so we were in executive session, and we're out of executive session. Yeah, we were in executive session, we got out of executive session, and we will take no action. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now the consent. Now we'll go to public hearing. No. Consent. Oh, okay, so the consent agenda. I messed you up. That's all right. Um, consent agenda, we are going to pull item F1. Oh, we are? Yes. Oh. Well, there you go. Next, let's go to public hearing. All right. Well, we have a whole series of public hearings, five of them this evening. They're all zoning cases that have come to us from planning and zoning. This first one is um, planning and zoning case 22.12.08. And mistaken this, I thought this was in Ward 1, but I've been told that that is not the case. This was requested by Adrian Chrisman. It's a, a small lot in the uh, food court parking lot, or what has been converted into the food court. The request this evening is for a special use permit so that they can establish an alcoholic beverage establishment there to serve in that area. 22 property owners were notified, five voted in favor, none voted in protest. Case was heard by P&Z on January 23rd. Planning and zoning approved this request. And so we'll go through these. This is the vicinity map. This is downtown up on Southwest Main Street. This is a little bit closer view of the food court. It's turned out marvelous. And this SUP, if I'm not mistaken, applies to the building that's in the center, that that would, that would be established as an alcoholic beverage um, location. <coughs> this is another photograph of the food court. Another photograph from the rear looking into. This is one more time, just a summary of what you're being asked to consider, a special use permit for a bar located in the downtown district. Staff and planning and zoning recommend approval of this request. Uh, we may have someone here if you have any questions, otherwise we're ready for a public hearing. So I will open a public hearing on item G1. With no one wishing to comment, I will close the public hearing and entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve item G1. That's <coughs> Second. Second. Um, do we have any other discussion? Then I will have a motion by Commissioner Jones and a second by, who was it? Pruitt. Commissioner Pruitt. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed? Shirley? She can't. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Okay, can't see your face. I understand. Okay, all right. Okay. Um, all right, next, let's move to item G2. Conduct a public hearing and discuss and consider an ordinance amending the Ennis Unified Development Ordinance, Article 4, Zoning District, Section 4.2, Residential Zoning Districts, Section 4.2, 10, Multifamily District, MF1. Well, this is planning and zoning case 22.12.19. This is a citywide um, update to the um, zoning or the uh, development ordinance. 
that would impact multifamily one districts. This was actually requested by the city staff based upon a discrepancy that was in there between MF1 and MF2. Um, the, this changes the height for the eave or the parapet from 35 feet to 45 feet and the top of the roof structure from 45 to 55 feet. This case was heard by P&Z on January 23rd. They sent the uh, request to you with their approval. Mark, do you want to come forward and offer any additional explanation for this or we've discussed this once before? Does anybody have any questions for Mark? And these are maximum, so like the 35 to 45, those are the maximum heights that's being adjusted. Anyone have any questions? Mark? Staff and planning and zoning recommend approval. This item does require a public hearing. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. At this time, I'll open a public hearing. With no one wishing to speak, I'll close the public hearing and entertain a motion. I make the motion to approve item G2. Second. I have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Holland, a second by Commissioner Hanza. Do we have any discussion? If not, I will ask for the vote. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed? Motion carries. Item G3, conduct a public hearing and discuss and consider an ordinance amending the zoning map of the city of Ennis, Texas from R10 single family residential district to CC corridor commercial district for an approximate 9.972 acre lot, tract or parcel of land in the city of Ennis, Ellis County, Texas. So these next three items, G3, G4, and G5 on your agenda are all part of the same development, although they're coming to you as separate zoning cases. So we'll take them one at a time. This is in Ward 1, requested by RM2 Developments. This is requesting that R10 be zoned to Corridor Commercial for a 9.9 acre tract of land for a commercial use to be determined. Nine property owners were notified, five voted in favor and zero voted in protest. This case was heard by Planning and Zoning on January 23rd and P&Z approved the request. This is the vicinity map. It's out on Highway 34 on your way to Sokol, and this is the, lo the general location of Case 1A, 1B, and 1C. And this is the zoning exhibit. This shows you the three different cases that you're going to consider. This evening, 1A is the parcel in blue, 1B is the parcel in orange, and 1C is that tiny little parcel in yellow. And this is the adjacent zoning for all three of these. R10, mostly surrounded by R10, there is apparently some corridor commercial um, up there in that corner on Highway 34. This is the site plan that's being proposed. Again, this particular case is just the red corridor commercial in the upper right-hand corner of this exhibit. This is just a quick review of item 1A, R10 to Corridor Commercial for 9.9 .9 acres. Planning and Zoning approved this request and staff recommends approval. This item does require a public hearing. Mayor, before we move on, um, I'm related to the applicants in this application, so I'm going to recuse myself from the next three items. Okay. If you'll step off the dais, please. Thank you. At this time, I will open the public hearing. With no one wishing to speak, I will close the public hearing and enter. Oh. I'm sorry, sir. <coughs> uh, yes, come, come on up. Do you have your? I do. I'll take it. Thank you. No, it's okay. And if you'll just state your name and your address for the record. Hi, Ron Hoskovec, uh, 261 Sunridge Drive here in Ennis, Texas. Um, and I'm an effective landowner. I own farmland uh, within the 200 feet uh, boundary uh, extension from the proposal to be developed. 
I'm on the north side of Highway 34 with uh, acreage of farmland. And uh, just like to tell you that I have voted in favor of this uh, proposal for the development and for all three, the commercial and the residential and the townhomes. Um, uh, I've actually went to school with Ernie Martinek uh, and we graduated together. I've known him my whole entire life. And I can tell you Ernie's gonna be someone that is gonna fulfill his commitments to the city. He's a good person, he's a good builder and developer. And, and that give, gave me a lot of confidence coming in here today, and I just wanted to throw some support to him. Um, I'll also say that he's done an incredible job of reaching out to the community. I think sometimes we need more of that with people coming in for proposals, but he's reached out to the neighbors. He's reached out to myself, and uh, it's always welcome to sort of know ahead of time you know, what somebody has planned because then it's very inclusive. You feel part of the process. Um, so I, I am supporting this entirely. Uh, I will say just a couple of uh, issues that I think the city should and probably is going to consider in the future. And one of mine, I spoke to Ernie about it, is just the width of the roadway in residential neighborhoods that are basically tight like this. They're going to be, I understand, R5, R7s, maybe up to R10s. But uh, I think going to a four-lane road in a lot of these dense developments is desirable from a safety standpoint. And that's where you would have sets of cars parked on each side in front of the houses. And you still have two lanes, two full lanes to get through for, for emergency vehicles, the fire department, police, for buses, and, and just also for trying to keep neighbors peaceful and everything and not being aggravated when they can't get through the roadways. Uh, it may not be something that can be done at this time, but I would just say as the future of Venice with its growth, just consider coming up with another minimum standard. I believe it's already, if I understand correctly, 30 feet wide, which allows three lanes of passageway. Uh, the second thing is this is going to put a lot of traffic on Highway 34, and, and I'm glad to see it's coming into Sonoma Trail as well for another exit entry point. Um, I know the city's working with TxDOT to improve the I-45, Highway 34 interchange. That, that's, that's, that's critical because sometimes with the gravel trucks coming from Scurry Rosser, it backs up all the way to the feed store. And, and, and Rowdy, you know, you know how bad that is to get through that particular light. I, I know time will take care of that. The second thing is just the speed limits have to be reduced on Highway 34. They're 45 miles an hour and, and it's actually within the city limits that we need to start slowing that traffic down before people hit the city limits, maybe to 35 or 40 miles an hour. But uh, safety is just something, I've lived here my whole life and, and I'm just really concerned about the safety of the citizens. And to me, that's something that could be done very easily that would actually be applicable to this development as you get into your planning. And that's really about it, just, uh, just, just wanna appreciate everybody here today that's putting in time on this and the city I think is very much going in the right direction and lived here my whole life. I'm proud to be uh, living in the city of Ennis and be a part of the community and uh, uh, I just would like to see some more growth before, uh, before too long and I think we're finally getting to that point to where uh, we have some nice growth in the city of Ennis and uh, we will expand in the future. So thanks again for your time and uh, appreciate it. Thank you Mr. Hoskovec. Would anyone else like to speak? Mm -hmm. We will. <coughs> Hello, Mr. Martinek. Born, raised here, uh, graduated here, married here, lived here a long time. Uh, family's been around for this this community for a uh, hundred years plus. And uh, I built my first house here, custom home builder, and built the first house on 2007 Pleasant Drive over there in Ennis. And then started building and, and uh, moved on to uh, Plano, different areas, and then DeSoto, and then Oakleaf, and now Waxahachie, and Ennis, so back this way, and we'll be um, building our personal house here on Martinek land for this this year. So we'll be moving back to 
to, to Ennis. And this project is something that a couple of years ago we looked at. Um, the actual the 100 acres was the Markin, Milton Markinek land. It's my dad's uh, brother. <coughs> and so we were looking at it, bought some church property next to it, and was it's really thought out. Uh, when we uh, did this, we actually wanted to, as far as the thoroughfare, you know, make sure we had the entrances. So we bought this, first that, then this, and then we said, we're going to do this. We bought that, and then give us the old fire. We actually... Instead of just getting the easement, actually bought, well, we had to buy the property because we wouldn't give us the easement. So we, we actually went ahead and bought that so that we could, because of the traffic flow, Lonnie mentioned traffic, <coughs> with the flow out of the subdivision, and that's one of the things that we did. We did this commercial, this commercial part uh, because it makes sense to have commercial on Highway 34. That's going to be the main entrance into the subdivision, and uh, then it'll, it'll move through uh, the main through the main subdivision and, and on from there. What it does, the, the uh, townhomes that this division is not in this plan development at this time, it will be when we reconfigure our town, townhome. They sort of change that up on us a little bit, uh, but that'll be coming soon also. But I wanted to just uh, say that's sort of how, the, the history of it, how it's coming about. Does anybody have any questions? questions? Thank you, Mr. Martin. Sure. Anyone else wish to speak? If not, I will close the public hearing and entertain a motion on item G3. Make a motion to approve G3 as stated. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Pruitt and a second by Commissioner Hansa to approve item G3 as stated. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed? The motion carries. Item G4, conduct a public hearing and discuss and consider an ordinance amending the zoning map of the City of Ennis, Texas from R10 Single Family Residential District 10 <coughs> to R5 Single Family Residential 5 Plan Development for an approximate 96.312 acre lot, tract or parcel of land and located in the City of Ennis, Ellis County, Texas. This is case 1B. <coughs> This is all, all of this is together in Ward 1. This is down, or this is zoning R10 to an R5 PD for 96 acres. It's a single family subdivision, 447 lots. 43 property owners were notified. Six returned letters voting in favor. Eight returned letters voting in protest. Um, and although you have more in protest than in favor, the area of the protest does not qualify to require a super majority vote for you this evening. So four affirmative votes would approve this if you choose to do so. This case was heard by P and Z on January 23rd. It was denied by P and Z with a split vote. Three of the commissioner voted in favor, three voted against, and one abstained from voting. So this is the same slide you've seen previously. This is the orange parcel, case 1B. This is the same site plan. It's all that residential development in the middle of the site plan with a variety of lots, lot sizes. And this is the lot table that uh, staff prepared for you to show you the minimum, the maximum, and the average size lots. And then the table on the right gives them by category and then the percentage of the entire development that is that particular lot size. This is again just a quick summary of case 1B. Staff recommends approval of this item. This item does require a public hearing. At this time I will open a public hearing. Good evening. My name is Reagan Martinick. Um, so, to kind of touch base on what uh, my dad said, um, just thanks for being here. This is he's been a custom builder uh, in the area his whole life. This is kind of my main voyage, my flagship. Um, so we have a lot of care, and we're we've been working on this, meeting with many of you for about a year and a half now. So we're very excited to bring this coming into fruition and getting it to this point. Um, 
The only thing this isn't excluding is that southwest corner of townhomes. That'll be on uh, a coming meeting. I did want to address a couple of things with uh, P and Z not approving. Um, it was uh, the three that were not in favor. Um, one, we weren't sure why they weren't in favor. Um, the other one's concern was for the adjacent neighbors and um, our development increasing property taxes. Um, we are not linked to property taxes, but Ennis's year over year has gone up 15% in home values. Further development um, will continue to raise the property values. Um, if that in turn raises their their tax percent or not percentage, but their participation, um, then that's what it is on raising taxes. The only way not to do that is to not have a development. Uh, lastly, the last not in favor not in favor stated she wanted larger lots. I think what she meant was she was wanting just a higher quality product um, because when the market doesn't support both larger lots and a higher quality, it has an inverse effect of if you have a larger larger lot, you are now diminishing the quality of the product. Um, every linear foot, every square foot has a cost to the consumer. Um, so if you're not fully utilizing that space, um, the consumer gets left with larger side lots and or larger side yards and not really benefit uh, trending now is they're wanting basically smaller footprints with a sub-zero fridge essentially things that are automated more green um, just what they get a higher quality for to put the larger lots into perspective if you take the average uh, i think they're saying seven thousand plus square foot lot on a two thousand square foot home um, you're looking at a $75,000 to $85,000 lot um, just with how development cost is now, with the cost of concrete, everything else. Um, once you start going vertical, you're looking at a carry cost for the builder of nearly $200 a square foot. Um, so for a sales price, you're looking at like 215 to 20 square foot. That's the equivalent to 400, mid $400,000 house. With interest rates now, that's a monthly payment to consumer about $3,700 a month. So that's not exactly the feasible market. Um, our target market is about 300 to 360,000 uh, in the later phases of the development. Um, current, current in its median is about 248 and climbing. Uh, so as we're phasing out, we should be the next level higher of quality homes uh, is what we are shooting for. Likely will be a four-phase development, uh, probably wrapping up sometime in 2028. Um, so we should be there um, at our target. Our neighborhood uh, put a lot of thought into it. It compromises, comprises of 447 lots, wide range. There is just two lots that were 5,653 square feet, all the way up to over 15,000 square feet. Um, so just under half the lots are under 6,000 square feet, leaving a vast majority from 6,000 to 10,000 and then a, a good handful of super premium lots. Um, the southern lots, those are gonna be backed up to a green space. We've been in talks with those property owners and our hopes to have a nice park there um, around that creek, uh, kind of in that area. All the western lots uh, against the adjacent existing neighborhood, those lots are a little bit larger. They're about 7,500. Um, I think one is over 14,000. So they're all right at the equivalent or a little larger than what is existing over there. Um, in our development, we have a l over 11 acres of dedicated green space at this time. Um, as I stated, with the southern property owners, I think it would end up being something like 30. But for right now, there's about 11 acres that's dedicated for green space. Um, we do hope to have a good handful of amenities. We have green space, park area, walking trails, and hopefully a couple of pretty nice amenities to kind of gather and uh, bring those younger families in. Um, it's right off Highway 34 and 45. So it's kind of a staple as you're driving by. That's the first major neighborhood um, that you'll be coming to. Uh, Ellis County is expected to double. So this would be a great way to encourage and kind of capture and support all the new local businesses coming in from 
bars to restaurants that are going to be sprouting up in the next couple of years. Um, there's a good number of house stops um, to help that. Uh, the residents, so there are currently, there are five egress points. 34 is going to be the main one. That one will have, it'll have to have a traf traffic impact study uh, once it goes through final engineering. Likely to have a, a turn lane, a dedicated turn lane for it, I would imagine. But this is a final concept. Um, once it goes through final engineering, traffic impact analysis, the engineers will, and, and TxDOT will help line out those details. Uh, what it looks like for the city, um, the project in total, 447 houses. The grand project, um, either 120 townhomes or 108 townhomes of the assisted living facility. That's roughly about $190 million for a gross project. That's about $1.3 million in annual property tax revenue for the city. The de this development is also the segue for further developments. Um, our neighbors, 100 acres, so forth and so on to continue development, <coughs> pushing out east um, in a healthy manner. So again, thank you all. Be happy to help answer any questions, comments, concerns. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? I'll close the public hearing. And I'm looking for a motion. Yes, I'd like to make a motion that uh, we amend item G4 by striking uh, <coughs> R5 single family residential district dash five plan development and uh, replacing that with PD 22 point one one point one eight point one B and then approving the ordinance. Do I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion among the commission? Then I have a motion by Commissioner Rayburn, a second by Commissioner Pruitt. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. The motion will carry. <coughs> Next, item G5, conduct a public hearing and discuss and consider an ordinance amending the zoning map of the city of Ennis, Texas from R10 single family residential district 10 to duplex district for an approximate <coughs> 1.417 acre lot, tract or parcel of land in the city of Ennis, Ellis County, Texas. This is the last of these three cases. This is case 1C. This is R10 being zoned duplex for a small parcel, 1.4 acres for a duplex subdivision. 12 surrounding property owners were notified, three voted in favor, two voted in protest. It does not require a super majority. This case was heard by P&Z on January 23rd and they approved the request. This is the same adjacent zoning that you've seen twice before. This is that tiny little yellow parcel over there by 1C. This is the same site plan you've seen, the yellow parcel in the upper left corner. This is a quick summary of, of P&Z case 1C. Both staff and planning and zoning recommend approval of this item. This item does require a public hearing. Thank you, Marty. At this time, I will open up the public hearing on item G5. Reagan Martinek again. Um, to clarify with the duplex, it's kind of a odd chunk of land right there. Um, couldn't be in the neighborhood, there wasn't enough space to make it inside the neighborhood. So the units there will face the back of the SP. Um, didn't exactly know what to do with it, so now it is gonna be basically owner-occupied and kind of a um, investment properties. I just get to live at work for a couple years. It's they're, nicer duplex units of what the blueprints are for right now um, and a place just to house personal equipment, stuff like that. But the reason for it being duplex was with what's on both sides facing the hall parking lot, just kind of an interesting piece. Um, so that was kind of best use for it. Okay, thank you.
So I open the public hearing now. I will, no one else willing, wanting to speak, I will close the public hearing and entertain a motion on item G5. Make a motion to approve G5 as dated. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Pruitt and a second by Commissioner Jones to approve item G5 as presented. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed? That motion carries. Um, next, we'll move to items for discussion and individual consideration. Discuss and consider approval of a resolution. Oh, wait, let's see. We're I'll wait one second. Yeah, we'll go. have uh, Commissioner Holland back. Excuse us just for one second. We'll wait for just one minute. <laughs> Fifteen minutes. <laughs> it was. It's an inside joke. Okay. Alrighty, item H1, discuss and consider approval of a resolution ordering a general joint election to be held at the city of Venice, Texas on May 6, 2023 for the purpose of electing a mayor pro tem at large, a commissioner for Ward 2 and a commissioner Ward 4, each to serve a three-year term and authorizing the execution of a contract with Ellis County Elections for election services. Move to approve item H1. Second. I have a motion by... Commissioner Can uh, Rayburn and a second by Commissioner ha uh, Mayor Pro Tem Holland, sorry, uh, to approve item H1 as presented. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed? Motion carries. Item H2, discuss and consider a resolution adopting and approving Active Ennis, the City of Ennis Parks and Recreation Master Plan 2023. Thank you, Mayor Juneman. Would you guys come forward and present the Parks Master Plan? Come on up. Introduce yourselves, and then we'll go through your slide deck. Right. Uh, Paul Lishka, Director of Parks and Recreation. Uh, over the past 14 months, uh, the Parks and Recreation uh, staff, uh, our consultants, DTJ Design, and the Parks and Recreation Board have uh, put a lot of work into producing this document. And I'm going to introduce Chris to go over a little bit of a synopsis. Hi, Chris. Good evening, Chris Moore, CEO of DTJ Design. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I'm honored to give you a quick summary of the work that we've been doing for your Ennis Parks and Rec Master Plan. So I have special thanks to uh, the Steering Committee, uh, the Parks Board, and the City staff for shepherding this through and uh, standing behind it and giving a lot of great input and a lot of great input from your, your residents as well. Um, I want to talk a little bit just about the, the process as a reminder. Um, it was a very extensive process. You see a, a flow chart there in front of you. Um, all throughout, a, a strategic public engagement happened uh, where there was outreach to the public and input from the public, which then led to a series of um, analysis, a deep analysis, a deep inventory, which led to um, goals and vision statements. We determined needs, and out of those needs um, came recommendations and priorities, um, which led to an action plan and finally an implementation plan as part of that report. So just as a reminder, a lot of this is driven by um, population growth, which is, was mentioned before. Um, we're looking 10 years out and more and making sure that the parks and recreation component of Ennis um, satisfies that potential need. So there in the bottom you see a potential growth in the year 2030 uh, to 40,000 and then um, to 60,000 in 2040 and beyond. So this is a robust plan. It's looking to um, manage that and incorporate all of the needs um, that your community will have over those 
next years. The vision statement that we have is Ennis Parks and Recreation System fosters a vibrant, equitable community by representing natural, natural assets, honoring rich cultural diversity, instilling healthy habits, and promoting a love of exploration. And a lot of that came out of uh, the comp plan, which then fed into um, this specific vision for the parks and recreation master plan. We're testing everything against four goals. Those four goals are quality of life, a family focused and equitable, healthy living and nature and culture. And as you read um, the action items that came out of this plan, you'll see it stated as how those tie back in to these specific goals and how we're meeting those goals and achieving those goals. And I think as you move forward, you can start to weigh um, implementation and action that you do take in the future in terms of how they relate to these goals that were established. A lot of the priorities come from um, several needs assessments. Those needs assessments are demand, um, which is determined by community engagement, what the community speaks about and what they desire, resource, what you have in place today, and then standards, how you compare against national standards, statewide standards, and standards of other cities your size. And so those all culminate together and lead to then um, recommendations on highest priority and then um, action items themselves. And so you see listed here four of the top priorities that we've uh, established, um, those being to modernize parks. You have a great park system in place and looking to find ways to modernize those parks. Um, complete Tim Guana Discovery Park, that is a great opportunity within your um, within your city to continue to uh, foster that and complete that park. Uh, the need for a water park and looking to establish that for your residents and then uh, various types of land acquisition as part of that. Th those are the top four. There are backup to those in terms of specific land acquisition. And so um, understanding the, um, the inherent value of the blue bonnets and protecting those corridors in a way that's meaningful and continues to uh, foster tourism uh, and a variety of action items associated with both community parks, neighborhood parks, special purpose and linear parks. And then specific to parks and trails, a variety of parks that um, should warrant your attention moving forward, um, leading with Tim Guana and um, moving down the list from there. Various recreation facilities, again, that top priority of the water park, um, thinking about an event center and a multi-use recreation center, all part of um, some strategic um, facilities that would um, benefit the city of Venice. And then you have a variety of uh, uh, maps associated with this that help guide um, the growth of your city. And a lot of this will come to light in terms of um, when cases come in, um, when other opportunities present themselves in terms of where future parks could occur in order to provide a well thought out system. Next is a trail network that connects all of those, um, not only in a loop system, um, which is highly desirable um, for cities of your size, but also um, spines and other types of city trails. And then finally, corridors, the Blue Bonnet corridors, as they, um, as they provide a, a good opportunity to showcase um, the special assets within your city. So I, I'm honored to present this. Um, this plan does present a very clear path for the city uh, to move forward to implement and continue your momentum of success. So we'd like to request your unanimous approval for your new parks and recreation master plan. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? If not. Thank you. No question. I would say thanks to Paul uh, and DTJ and everyone that was involved with this whole process, I mean, this is a huge stepping stone for us. Quality of life in parks specifically has been a huge focus. 
it needed to be a huge focus and it has become so. So you guys helped us, so thank you. Uh, you've made a really large impact on our community. Thank you. Um, I'll entertain a motion on item H2. Motion to approve item H2 as presented. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Hansa and a second by Commissioner Jones. Um, so no, I'm sorry. Pruitt. It was Commissioner Rayburn. Pruitt. Commissioner Pruitt. 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 I'm so sorry. Commissioner Bye. Pruitt. Um, any discussion? No, thank you, guys. You have done, I know you all put a lot of hard work in this. Yeah, thank you. I mean, this is obviously a very professional product. I mean, it, um, it, it looks great, but looks aren't everything. It's the content that matters. And from, from what I've looked at, the content looks uh, very, very good as well. All right, any other discussion? And now I'll <coughs> entertain a vote. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed, the motion carries. Thank you so much. Yay! All right. 15 Let's minutes. Move to item H3. <laughs> Discuss and consider a resolution granting a petition for annexation from property owner Ryan Potok for property identified as being Ellis CAD ID 194773, located at 4151 <coughs> Lakeview Drive, and being an approximate 21.57 acre tract of land situated in the J. Mott Survey, abstract number 667, and in the O. Shannon Survey, abstract number 989, Ellis County, Texas, and the pr proposed annexation of the portion of Lakeview Drive adjacent to said territory, setting a date, time, and place for a public hearing on the proposed annexation of certain property by the City of Ennis, authorizing and directing the City Secretary to have published notice of each public hearing, and authorizing and directing City staff to negotiate and enter into a written services agreement. <coughs> That was a long one. It was. So this is a petition for annexation that we received from Ryan Potok. It's at 4151 Lakeview Drive. This is out by the Bardwell Lake for a parcel of 21.57 acres. This is the view, the yellow star all the way out by Bardwell Lake is where this parcel is located. This is a little bit closer view. The parcel is um, highlighted in yellow. And just for reference, I wanted to show that it's right across the street from the new Prairie View neighborhood uh, that is currently under construction. This is a view of the surrounding city limits. So several of these parcels have been um, voluntarily annexed as a part of the development agreements that were done several years ago. And this parcel is highlighted in the light blue. So it's absolutely appropriate for us to annex this property, especially since we received the petition voluntarily. And so with that, staff recommends approval of item H3 as presented. Do I have a motion on item H3? Motion to approve item H3 as presented. Second. So a motion by Commissioner Hansen, and a second by Commissioner Rayburn. Any further discussion? If not, I'll take a vote. All those who in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed? The motion carries on H3. H4, discuss and consider approval of a resolution authorizing payment to Ellis County to overlay portions of Nasuda Road, Ryder Road, and Lakeview Road that fall within the, unin within the incorporated limits of the City of Ennis through the interlocal cooperative contract between S County of Ellis and City of Ennis and a sum not to exceed the amount of $115,752.00. So this is a view, these were three um, that the city of Ennis and Ellis County cooperated to get roads overlaid with new asphalt. Ed, do you wanna step forward in case the commissioners have any questions? And do you wanna explain a little bit how this works? Uh, yes, sir, you generally, uh, commissioner. Good evening. Mayor. Uh, generally the commis uh, commissioner. Grayson. Grayson generally calls me up. He'll have contractors in the area, they're working on their county roads and they're contiguous with our roads. A lot of times and you can look at the exhibits coming up and you'll see that there's segments where they come and go from the county into the city and possibly back into the county. And so uh, 
probably going to be updating our process to better document it because they a lot of times they're spread out over time when he has contractors in working on things. Uh, Lakeview come in first. Uh, they proceeded with that, and then later in the year they came in uh, with the same contractor we were using at the time uh, to do these other overlays. And so that's uh, the locations we got done. Uh, each individually locations around 40,000, but by the time they got through overlaying them, they added up to a, a level that required commission action or would have been your soon. Okay. You know what the thickness is going to be? It's two and a half inches. Two and a half yes, of yes, deep, of probably. Deep. That's what the county was using, and so that's. Uh, they actually put that on two and on a two course penetration, so it's a decent. <coughs> Get years out of these roads. So this this work has already been done, yeah, correct? It's been done. We're just reimbursing. Yeah. Yeah. County. Any other? <clears throat> I'll entertain a motion on item H four. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Ed. Entertain a motion on item H four. I make the motion to approve item H four. Second. I have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Holland and a second by Commissioner Rayburn to approve item H four. Is there any? Discussion among the commission at all? No. If not, I'll take a vote. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed? <clears throat> Item H4 passes. Item H5, discuss and consider the approval of a resolution by the City Commission of the City of Ennis, Texas, authorizing the purchase of the G2 Fire Station Alerting System through U.S. Digital Designs, including one dispatch system and three station voice licenses on a Houston-Galveston Area Council contract in an amount not to exceed $54,720.95. Bill, will you come forward and present your item? Good evening, Mayor and Commission. Good evening. This is a fire station alerting system that we're proposing to purchase that will work in uh, conjunction with the police department's CAD or computer-aided dispatch system. Uh, what this system will do is it's going to make the life of our dispatchers easier and it's going to help get the firemen rolling quicker. Kind of giving you a brief overview. When you dial 911, the dispatch operator is going to answer the phone and they're going to ask you some vital information. You know, what is your address and what is the nature of your emergency? For example, if it's a heart attack, they're going to put in a call type for a heart attack. It's going to give them an address or they're going to ask your address. It's going to determine which fire truck needs to respond to that and which ambulance. The dispatcher can then hit a button and it's going to send that necessary information of call type and address to the prospective fire station while they're still on the phone with the caller. They can gather additional details. It's basically taking the, the sending of the information over the radio out of their hands initially. Um, in the fire station, we're going to get clear, concise calm information that gives us our call type and our address where we're responding to while they're still gathering necessary information that they can pass on a few moments later. So um, looking at the bullet points there, the Phoenix G2 system, it's a computer automated dispatch module that will assist the dispatchers greatly by taking over the task of sending that initial call information to the fire stations. Um, that information is speech generated in a fraction of a second, and it's sent over the, the current radio system that we have in the stations. Uh, the voice alert speech is produced in a calm, crystal clear voice. It's computer generated. We can select it being male voice or a female voice. It's dealer's choice. And it's delivered digitally over the radio. As I said earlier, it's going to help reduce the response, response times of the fire apparatus and ambulances and provide calm, clear, consistent information for the responding crews. Um, being in the fire service, if someone calls and they say, you know, my house is on fire, when the dispatcher relays that information to us, depending on how that information is relayed can affect our response. If, if they're excited, we tend to be excited. So having the computer take that process over, it's a computer generated voice. It's the same tone, the same way every time that that happens. Um, the Phoenix G2 system, as I said earlier, it's going <coughs> to reduce response times. Um, it's going to take a workload off of the dispatchers. It'll improve health and safety. It's reliable, and it's, it's technology. It's the way of the future, and it, it's really going to improve the way we do things. 
this is kind of an overview if you combine this with the CAD system. This is where I want to go. But the green arrow there on the left, when 911 rings, I would like the dispatchers to answer that call within 15 seconds. If you move to the right, the call processing time, they have 60 seconds to process it. And they're going to hit the station alerting button. It's going to transfer to the right again. Fire and EMS personnel are going to have 60 to 80 seconds to get ready. And then ultimately, we want to be at your address within 240 seconds. So this system is going to help bring all of that together along with the computer-aided dispatch system. Are there any questions I could answer for you? Any questions for Bill? Chief, I'm, I'm just a little curious. How, how does this system uh, work in circumstances, or is it even used in circumstances, uh, where we have mutual aid calls from neighboring departments? Does it still work the exact same way? Because um, I, I assume whenever we're sending out um, mutual aid, it, I guess, is it, is it always the, the nearest vehicle that's going, or is it sometimes a vehicle from a, a different station in town? Or I'm just curious how this system would work. So this, state, this system here is specifically, it's a station alerting system. So it's mm -hmm. how the information gets from the dispatcher to the fire stations. The piece that Chief Munn's going to present here in a moment, the CAD system, based on information that I provide it, it's going to determine which fire truck needs to go based on an address and a call type. Mm -hmm. So what resource needs to respond where is part of the computer-aided dispatch system. We preload that system with response plans, um, and then based on the address call type, it decides what unit to send. What you're being asked to approve here is how the information gets from the dispatcher to the fire station. So I, I guess, what, um, and, and this may build more into to what he's, he's going to uh, tell us, but I guess my, my uh, question is more of, so say that there's a uh, structure fire in Ferris and um, they're requesting mutual aid. And when that dispatcher enters in Ferris, Texas, structure fire, I assume if we get a structure fire in Ennis, we're, we're not going to empty every station, but we're, we're not just, we're, we're sending more than one station. We're sending two apparatus. Will that system be able to know not to empty all of our fire stations and send them all to, to Ferris automatically, or will it just send one unit, or I guess kind of how, how that works? Right. This system does not understand that. All this system is doing is repeating what the dispatcher entered in the computer. For example, you call 911. What is your emergency? My chest hurts. They're going to ask you your address, and it's going to send to the fire station, truck 191, respond to 123 Happy Street for a chest pain. That's simply all it's going to say. The computer-aided dispatch center, the system that's next, is going to keep us from dumping the fire station to Ferris yeah. or sending okay. all the fire trucks in the city of Ennis. So two different systems, but they do work very closely together. Any other questions for Chief? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chief. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'll entertain a motion now on item H5. Motion to approve item H5 is presented. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Hanza and a second by Mayor Pro Tem Holland to approve item H5 is presented. Any further discussion <coughs> by the commission? I'll therefore take a vote. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed, the motion will carry. Item H6, discuss and consider approval of a resolution of the City of Ennis, Texas, authorizing the purchase of one new Genie GTH 636 rough terrain forklift in a total amount of $109,676.25 from Rick Bauscher, Inc., doing business as Equipro on source well bid 041719 to ER and providing an effective date. We discussed this a little bit earlier. This is the all-terrain um, forklift. Public Works has requested. This was previously approved as a single purchase item. However, the final price came back a little bit over that. So we wanted to bring this back to, your, to you for further consideration. Um, this will remain within the right and left limit of that original appropriation. We're recommending approval of this purchase for the Public Works Department. All right, I will entertain a motion on item H6. I make the motion to approve a item H6. Second. I have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Holland and a second by Commissioner Hanza to approve item H6 as presented. All those in favor, please. Oh, well, first of all, is there any discussion by any of the commission? If not, I'll, 
enter a vote. Please, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed, the motion will carry. Item H7, discuss and consider approval of a resolution authorizing the city manager to execute a license and service agreement with Tyler Technologies to provide computer-aided dispatch and records management software in support of one-time cost of $651,434 plus recurring fees and maintenance totaling $91,835. Chief Munn, you're up. Computer-aided dispatch and records management system. Thank you, sir. Madam Mayor, Commission, thank you for considering our uh, agenda item this evening. Um, as part of our commitment to you and the citizens of the city of Ennis, uh, this is another big step towards uh, taking our public safety services to the next level and creating a new tier from which to operate. Our, our CAD RMS system uh, impacts every part of public safety service delivery. Everything from call inception to prosecution. It's the backbone of our 911 communications for police and fire operations and has a direct impact on police, fire, EMS emergency response time, data collection, retrieval and analysis, uh, call turnaround time, investigative approaches all the way through to prosecution. So basically, the, the computer aided dispatch side of this. Uh, is what will serve as what uh, Chief Evans was uh, presenting a minute ago. And that's just a, a piece of it, certainly. Um, the records management system, or RMS, is basically the information backbone of our entire data services uh, in the police department. So every, every piece of uh, paper that we generate now will be computerized, first of all. Second of all, um, it's the repository for all of our calls for service, how we document everything from the time the phone rings until, uh, again, we file a case with the district attorney's office. So every offense report, every incident report, every call sheet for service that does not necessarily require a report, all of our documentation goes into this uh, records management and CAD system. So our current CAD RMS system is with E-Force, and the city's been with that system since uh, 2007. Um, it was up to the task at that point, but unfortunately it's become antiquated uh, and has very limited expansion capability for, for where we've got, come in law enforcement specifically. It's uh, currently browser-based, web-based, and solely dependent on a single internet connection. So our, our ability to have redundancy in operations does not exist currently. Uh, functions are very siloed. It has limited integration with uh, requiring redundancy and data entry. So when I say that, so kind of go back to what Chief Evans was trying to build upon in terms of turnaround on uh, call time. So when a dispatcher takes a call, they're, they're inputting that data into their keyboard. And so once they start doing that, and once they hit that initiation, his firefighters will go ahead and get that tone out while the, while the dispatcher is still collecting data and perhaps uh, sending police officers to the same scene if it's going to require a two-tiered response. So it kind of frees them up, gives them some flexibility to do other things, but yet it initiates <coughs> his crews so that they can start getting ready to roll out much faster than, than we currently can do with multitasking of data. Not only that, but once data is entered now, uh, where a dispatcher may enter a piece of data, well then the officer may have to enter it two or three times later on in the system, depending upon if there's a report made, if there's an arrest made, and, and things of that nature. So. So we've got a lot of gaps in where we're, where we're not very efficient with the current product because of the data redundancy issues. Um, we also currently have some inconsistent historic data entry, which makes, uh, makes our, our analytics extremely limited and frankly unreliable, uh, particularly the further back we go. Um, that's something that we will really be able to clean up with a new CAD RMS system is all of our data coming in, you know, we all, we all look at statistics, we have data, and we know that bad data in equals bad data out. Um, this gives us a huge opportunity to start clean so that all of our data going in is clean, and then our, our work product on the back side will be cleaner as well. Um, the analytics tools are also, they leave quite a bit to be desired. Uh, in many cases, we're sitting literally taking tip marks off of different pieces because if it's just so, um, it's not integrated essentially. So depending upon what data sets we're trying to look at, it's, it makes it very cumbersome. 
So when we considered, this has been a, a fairly lengthy process, as you might imagine. Um, we, we discussed with our own internal stakeholders and uh, with the police, police department, within our different functions, with records, criminal investigations, patrol, our administrative staff, um, of course the fire department. Um, we discussed uh, uh, at length uh, how we can overlay and inter, inter, intertwine with their operations to make all of those data collection pieces much more seamless. Um, we also wanted to consider uh, the EMS function, which uh, what I'm about to go into will, will uh, certainly integrate with uh, AMR systems as well to get their call times also turned around much faster. Um, we looked at four different systems, of course, E-Force e uh, in our initial phase to try to determine what expansion capability we would have with them. Um, Motorola, um, we were in extensive interviews with them and, and presentations that we attended at Midlothian PD along with several other agencies um, to try to see what interoperability we will have interagency within the county. Um, Central Square, I believe, is what uh, Waxahachie currently has. Uh, some other agencies have it. It's a decent product, um, as well as uh, Tyler Technologies. And after the extensive reviews of all of these four top-tier products, well, three top-tier, one, one being the current, um, we, we decided that Tyler Technologies offered the best value for the city of Ennis and our public safety uh, professionals. So why Tyler? Um, very flexible and user-friendly across all of our applications. Um, it integrates, and to me, th to me this is uh, the biggest key. Um, it integrates a lot of our technologies and allows us to upgrade some technologies that we don't quite have yet. Um, key for officer safety, in my mind, is the GPS uh, automated vehicle location systems. We're currently operating off a fleet management system that, that only updates every minute and a half to two minutes. And so if I've got officers on the move, certainly they were not where they were two minutes ago. So you can imagine how quickly that data needs to update. Um, this modern, more modern system certainly will keep, give us real-time updates on, on locating our officers in the event they get in a bad situation and we can't get them over the radio. Um, TLATS, which is our Texas Law Enforcement Telecommunications System that gives us access to the National Criminal Information uh, Center and the Texas Crime Information Center, um, which is basically all your criminal history information Everything from license plates through uh, um, rap sheets, uh, previous contacts, things of that nature. Anything that might be in a criminal history, we can access through this. Currently, we have to operate in a separate standalone uh, window to even access this, whereas this will actually give us a link to TLETS that is uh, within CEGIS compliance, which we have to maintain uh, as an agency to secure all criminal justice data and that's, a, that's an FBI protocol uh, certification. Uh, LiveScan is our fingerprint machine that we use inside the uh, jail facility. Um, AMR, again, I mentioned earlier that uh, this will seamlessly integrate with their current CAD systems that they, that they have at AMR, uh, the G2 Phoenix system that uh, Chief Evans presented. Uh, we currently use Brazos Citation and Crash Reporting, which is a, a handheld device uh, where we input data. It's also a Tyler Technology product, along with, I believe, several other currently utilized uh, city software programs. Uh, so we know that Tyler's got a good reputation and, and a good working relationship with the city, but we're also also using uh, those ticket riders and printers, and that will allow, if you, once you, again, going back to the data entry, uh, you input that data one time, and now you can pull that to other pieces if you, if you go beyond a citation or a crash report into an offense report, et cetera, arrest report. Really cuts down on turnaround time for our officers. Um, redundant in-house security server hosting with secondary secure data storage. And what we're, what we're going to be um, looking at there is getting away from a cloud-based browser system that's dependent solely on an Internet connection. We want to create some redundancy so that if we had the worst happen, say in our dispatch center, we can stand up and, and maintain operational continuity by standing up operations at uh, Fire Station 3, which is our secondary emergency operations center as well. And then we also want to have off-site uh, data storage, uh, again, so that we maintain that CGIS compliance that we talked about. Um, and, and we own our data. It's not off in a cloud somewhere. It's not at some third-party location. And finally, uh, the CAD or the uh, Tyler product is is amongst the products we we considered, 
is the most reasonably priced multifaceted solution. So looking at the total investment summary, the one-time costs that we're asking you for this evening uh, will be coming, from, well, all of these costs will be coming from the CCPD fund balance. So, so these are funds that we've, uh, we've looked to, to uh, not be a burden on our, on our general fund, certainly, and, and this is well within the, the, um, um, the capacity of the fund and certainly the scope of the fund. Um, the one-time cost up front for software and services uh, is $651,434. The additional servers, data storage, consulting, the, the wiring required to get all of the infrastructure in place uh, for that secondary redundant uh, server setup for our, for our operations and our data collection um, will be no more than $150,000. And that's something that's going to be presented in, uh, I believe, uh, Stephen's uh, budget uh, amendment. And then recurring cost annually, uh, not year one, but one year from our stand-up, which this is about a 12 to 18 month stand-up project once we, once we get the approval. So we're, we're 12 to 18 months from going fully live with anything that we go with. But uh, annually, one year from that, um, currently we've been quoted $91,835 for services and fees for maintenance of the software and upkeep of the system. And with that, I will stop rambling and answer any questions you may have. Does anyone have any questions for Chief? Thank you, Chief. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, at this time, I will entertain a motion on item H7. Motion to approve item H7 as presented. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Hansa and a second by Commissioner Pruitt to approve item H7. Is there any discussion from the commission? No, uh, I do have a quick question. So the reoccurring fees and maintenance totaling $91,000, over what time period is, is that going to cover reoccurring fees and, and maintenance? I believe annual. that's an oh, annual. 91, that's every year. Annual. Okay. Any other? All right. At this time, I'll take a vote. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed? Item H7 will carry. <coughs> Next on item H8, discuss and consider an ordinance amending the fiscal year 2023 budget. All right, Stephen, would you please come up and present the uh, budget amendments? Congratulations, Chief. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Good evening, Mayor and City Commission. This is the FY 2023 budget amendment ordinance that's on the agenda. I'll start off by stating that the city controls the adopted budget at the fund level. And so the city manager is authorized to move funds within the budget, but the commission's within the fund, but the commission's approval is, is needed in order to transfer a budget from one fund to another fund. And also the city commission's your approval is also <coughs> needed in order to increase a total appropriation above, above its adopted and bud budgeted fund level. This particular ordinance that's in your packet tonight is needed for several reasons. One reason is because we have projects that were approved and budgeted last fiscal year, and those projects are still ca have carried on to the current fiscal year. So we need to move the remaining budget to the current fiscal year to, so we would have budget for the expenditures. There's also some supplemental appropriations for new projects and positions, which I'll go over in the following slides. This amendment is also needed due to a reorganization that recently occurred and also to establish a, a fleet replacement fund. The first fund that we'll take a look at is, is the general fund. So the budget amendment is increasing the general fund appropriation by 244,000 to support a reorganization. This includes transferring the tourism fund operations to the general fund and adding a tourism manager, tourism coordinator, tourism administrative assistant, an economic development specialist, and also an Ennis Cares program manager. Although all of these positions and, and functions, we will be moved to the general fund. 
there will also be funds transferred from tourism over to the general fund to cover the tourism functions and the tourism positions. There was a position that was eliminated in the, in the tourism department that is going to provide budget savings in order to offset some of these some of the costs. Also the economic economic development specialist funds will be transferred from EDC to cover that position. And then we have the NS Cares program manager, which we're going to use Quilp in order to offset those costs. The next amendment needed under the general fund is a supplement appropriation because we recently approved a grant to the Heights in a, an amount of, of $50,000. So we need to add the budget to that for that. And the cost is going to hit the general fund, but that's also a uh, transfer in from the QIP fund to offset that cost. Uh, also, we have a part of this amendment, 54000 for the fire station alerting <coughs> system that you guys approved tonight as a part of this amendment. Budget is also going to be increased by 405000 for a public works temporary building, welcome center facade completion, electric panel adjacent to the post office for downtown <coughs> events, and also a drainage channel lining project. In addition to that, there will be a, an increase of 405000 for city hall the City Hall expansion project, the completion for, of this building, and also for the office furniture. Included is also 67000 that was budgeted and approved the last fiscal year for the strategic plan. That project is expected to be completed sometime in March, so this budget is needed to be rolled over in order to complete the project. The total budget amendment increase to the general fund is going to total $1.2 million. But with that, at the end of FY 2022, the city did see a, experience a surplus of $2.9 million to the general fund, which increased the general fund fund balance to 41%, well above the, the target of 25%. And with this budget amendment, it's anticipated and projected that the fund balance would decline to 37%, still well above the 25% target. The next fund is CCPD. And included in this budget amendment is a rollover from last fiscal year. We budgeted 135,000 for police vehicles. Those vehicles are gonna be ex paid for in the current fiscal year. So we need to roll the budget over. It also includes 801,000 for the police computer aided dispatch and record management software that you guys just approved. It increases the budget appropriation for this fund by 131,000 for a rifle and body armor packages as well. The total budget amendment totals 1 million. The current fund balance will decline from 1.7 million in CCPD to roughly around 700,000 will, will be remaining in the fund. This slide is, a, is communicating the fleet replacement fund amendment. Currently we do not have a fleet replacement fund. What's being proposed here is that we transfer the budget that we currently have in the general <laughs> fund and also the water and sewer fund and create a new fleet replacement fund. This new re fleet replacement fund will enable us to better manage the revenue and expenditures and also to more efficiently and effectively report on the performance of the vehicle program with enterprise. The amendment also includes amendments to the water and sewer fund, including an increase of 40,000 for water and sewer fitting inventory. There's also an increase of 15,000 for the wastewater treatment plant plumbing repairs are needed. 
It adds 15,000 for the 2022 bond principal requirement. The total budget amendment totals 70,000 and the fund balance will remain at 28%, which is still above the 25% <coughs> target. This slide is showing a list of, of projects that we need a budget amendment for. The first few projects are projects that were budgeted last fiscal year and have carried over to the current fiscal year. And we need to roll the budget to complete the projects. Those projects include the, the Gravity Line project, the tank rehab, the Arnold Street project and the Preston Street project. Also included is an unbudgeted water line repair that was needed for 17,000. Sewer line Avenue E, we're needing to increase that budget by 956,000. Fresh pet by 2.9 million. We also have lift station backup work that is needed along with wastewater main for 280,000. And then there's also a roof repair for 34,000. So the bu total budget amendment for this fund is gonna total to 5 million. The total fund balance currently is 6.1 million. And after this budget amendment, the fund balance is projected to define to 1.1 million for additional projects that's needed. Moving on to the general capital project fund amendments. The first project listed is the Cottonwood Creek project that we're adding budget an amount of 524,000. This is for design and management fees for this project. This project will be funded by the TWDB funding that we just got a loan for and issued. The next few projects are all rollover projects from last fiscal year. The Brown Street renovation, which is old City Hall, um, 104 North McKinney parking lot, then, then the Arnold Street project completion, and also the underground refuse project are all rollover projects, totaling 883,000. The, the fund balance for this fund will decline to 427,000 um, after these changes. Other budget amendments will include amendments to the sanitation fund, including 58,500 for filling, capping, and closure of old 80, the old 85 landfill. Also, 74,000 for trash containers and dumpsters. The total budget amendment, 132,000. Then in the street reconstruction fund, there will be a budget amendment of 17,500 for Park Street traffic calming design, and also $150,000 for payment, a pavement management system study and implementation, totaling 100. and 67,000 for the street reconstruction um, budget amendment. This particular fund balance will remain at 1,093,000 after these projects are, are implemented. So still a very strong fund balance for, for this fund. In economic development, we had some budget from last fiscal year for marketing that was not spent that the department is requesting to roll over to the current fiscal year uh, for the 6,838. And then in the debt service fund, we are needing to add 150,000 for the 2022 CO bond principal requ requirements. And for the debt service fund, the, the fund balance is sufficient to cover all debt service requirements this fiscal year. And that concludes my presentation. 
staff recommends approval and I can answer any questions. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I saw one item that was, uh, I believe it was a, a temporary building. Is that is that something that we've already voted on, or is that something new, possibly upcoming? For the um, public, public the one public at Public Works. Works. Yeah, so they're converting the uh, existing, because we hired all the new staff. <coughs> I don't think we have brought that item to you specifically. Do you remember if it was on the individual purchase items that the City Commission considered? Or has it come up after that? This is the portable building to put your conference room in and the parks staff in to make room for the other staff that you're hiring. We have not presented that. Have not presented <coughs> it yet. So the short answer is this is the first time you're seeing that item. It's a temporary building that would be out so that we could have another conference room for public works. And we're going to move, I think, three or four of the park staff into that to make room in the in the main public works headquarters for the additional staff that you guys approved. Did you say is this a permanent structure? Temporary. 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 Yeah. Temporary but probably probably there for a couple of years. So Part of what we need to do at some point in the future is do the public work study, facilities study. Um, we have, that's kind of the last area of the city that we haven't really taken a close look at. We've renovated and done all the city facilities except public works. And now we've got so many more staff coming in, we don't have office space and workspace for them. So this is just an interim solution, but it'll probably be that way for a couple of years. Thank you, Marty. Any other questions? Uh, I'd like to say thank you, Marty, for uh, that pavement management uh, deal. Because <laughs> I've been bending his ear for a couple of years now about getting that thing. So he finally he finally did it to keep my mouth shut. So thank you, Marty. <laughs> and Marty, yes, also thank the you Street. for the Park Street traffic calming design. Yes, yes. Um, we, we're going to need the money to implement that design as well, but uh, we that we're a step in the right direction. So. so I know that this is a this is like a gigantic budget amendment, and it seems a little overwhelming. Um, but this is kind of how we need to do business to be flexible, to account for things that come up and opportunities that present themselves that we didn't even see when we were developing the initial budget. Sure. And fortunately, the city is in such a good financial condition that we're able to do these kind of things. And I know staff appreciates your support and your understanding when we bring these things to you. All right. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. With that, I'll entertain a motion on item H8. Make a motion we approve item H8. Second. And approve. A motion by Commissioner Jones and a second by Commissioner Rayburn to approve item H8 as presented. All those in favor? Well, first of all, any nope. further discussion? Nope. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed? The motion will carry. Thank you all very much. At this time, we are adjourned at 8.46. Everybody have a nice evening. All right. <laughs>